Good afternoon. We start this afternoon uh, with a consideration of business motion 9292 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a revised business programme for today. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to say so now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 9292. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no one's asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 9292 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. We move on now to portfolio questions. And we start with question number one from Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government how it will provide sustainable funding in the future for the Scottish Sports Association. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. The Scottish Government has a strong relationship with uh, the SSA and appreciates the support they provide to Scottish sporting governing bodies. The SSA is a membership organisation made up of sporting governing bodies and we route funding to support our SGBs through Sports Scotland and we do not provide core funding to the SSA. In financial year 2017-18, we provided funding for, to the SSA to carry out a short-term project focused on assessing equalities issues within SGBs as well as work supporting the government to identify grassroots nominations for the honours process. Lewis MacDonald. The Minister appreciates the importance of the SSA as the independent voice of Scottish sport and uh, I, I hear what she says about 2017-18. My question was around sustainable funding for the future and I know the Minister went to the AGM of the SSA last year and made a commitment as Minister to ensuring that the SSA would have sustainable funding for the future. Does she recognise that the fact that the funding both directly from Government and from Sports Scotland is, this, is, is now planned to be cut. Does she recognise that that falls short of the commitment she gave and will she review the funding position to ensure that the SSA has the funding it needs to continue to act as the independent voice of Scottish sports? Minister. Yeah, I, I did. I attended the AGM uh, last year and we made that commitment to provide funding for the SSA to carry out that short-term project. Uh, work with them as well to enable them to secure uh, additional sources of funding. We absolutely respect the right of uh, governing bodies to come together under a representative body and recognise that whilst the SSA does not represent all governing bodies, some uh, members of the SSA value that collective voice of the governing body's role played by the SSA. Uh, and we recognise uh, that they uh, continue to ensure that they articulate the voices of our governing bodies of all uh, different sizes and certainly again you know our uh, relationship with the SSA is strong but we don't provide core funding and that's why we provided that support last year in order for them to do that specific bit of work and of course we can continue on that basis to look if there are ways in which they can provide uh, additional uh, information to us or work with us collaboratively uh, to enable us to work towards uh, ensuring that we create the Act of Scotland that we all seek. Thank you, Presiding Officer. F further to Lewis MacDonald's question, does that mean that the Minister does plan to find a way to fund the SSA in the forthcoming financial year? Minister. Like I said, we don't uh, support, uh, we don't provide core funding to the SSA. We route our funding to support our governing bodies through Sports Scotland and the SSA is a membership organisation made up of those governing uh, bodies. We absolutely, again, reiterate what I said to Lewis MacDonald, respect the right of governing bodies to come together under a representative body and we'll continue to work with the SSA <laughs> to uh, explore uh, avenues for them to have a sustainable financial future. And I'll continue to engage with members who have a particular interest in this and I know that there are lots of bits of correspondence coming to us and from uh, MSP across the chamber and we'll continue to keep them updated uh, on the progress that SSA make. Fulton McGregor. President officer, and I can put on record my apologies for um, coming in slightly late for the start of Lewis MacDonald's uh, question. Uh, national lottery income for good causes reduced by 14% between 2015-16 and 2016-17. Would, would the minister agree with me that UK government's lack of action to address this important issue is putting the delivery of sport at risk? Minister. Well, I'm a bit surprised as to why there were groans across the chamber, considering many people come to the chamber and continually ask me to, to provide support for funding. And given that we all know that 
The National Lottery is an important source of funding available uh, to Sports Scotland. And given that we know that there is a, 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 the financial year that their income is expected to be 26% lower than in 2015-16. So again, all these cries and moans from across the chamber is a complete surprise because we absolutely need to recognise that this is a challenge. And that is why on the 7th of November, along with my colleague, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and Tourism <coughs> and External Affairs, we sent a joint letter to the UK government highlighting the impact on both the sport and cultural sectors and the concern that at that point the UK government were failing to act to address that issue. I've now received a response to that letter from Karen uh, Bradley talking about how they will be looking to uh, bring about some improvements. However, we'll continue to monitor that situation and raise that issue again when I next meet the Parliamentary Undersecretary for State for Sport, Tourism and Heritage. But I think, Presiding Officer, despite the groans, that Fulton McGregor is absolutely right to raise this as an issue because it's a real concern for many good causes across our country. Question number two, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to ensure that sport is funded to enable access for all. Minister. The Government remains committed to helping Scotland be more physically active, providing the right facilities in the right places and ensuring our world-class <laughs> sporting facilities cater to performance athletes and local communities alike. We are committed to ensuring that sports facilities are affordable, accessible and inclusive to people who want to get involved and stay involved in sport. For example, there are now better and more opportunities for people of all ages and abilities to participate in sport and physical activity <laughs> across Scotland, with 181 community sports hubs up and running, increasing to 200 by 2020. In 2017 alone, we have provided sports governing bodies with an additional 2 million specifically to target work on equalities, established the 300,000 Sporting Equality Fund, established the Women and Girls in Sport Advisory Board to drive female sports participation, invested nearly £1 million to support older adults in care to become active, and we formally opened the Sports Scotland National Sports Training Centre, Inverclyde, offering world-class sporting facilities and services that will have a positive impact to users at all levels of physical ability. Brian Whittle. I thank the Minister for that answer. However, on the back of withdrawing funding to ensure all primary school pupils have the opportunity to learn to swim, the debacle with Jog Scotland when funding was only reinstated after much lobbying and the reduction in the sports budget by some £4 million last year, we now hear that the Scottish Sports Council, which is their direct link with, between government and sport, has had its funding withdrawn. How can the Minister possibly state that the Scottish Government is committed to sport and activities for all with the implications that has on preventable health agenda when it seems hell-bent on cutting every budget that has a positive effect on the health of the nation and tackling health inequalities? Minister Ian Campbell. So again, on the back of that uh, question to me, I don't really understand why he groaned so much when Fulton McGregor made a perfectly reasonable point about recognising the impact that the reduction in national lottery income will mean uh, for sport and activity across the country. I outlined a range of work that we are taking forward to ensure that sport and opportunities uh, and for, to be active are available to everybody across uh, the country. Of course, there are still more things that we need to do. But again, you know, aside from this, Brian Whittle continually comes to this chamber looking for us uh, to always uh, come up with the answer to some of the issues around inequalities. And I hear he says we are the government and it's this government that continually have to pick up the pieces for the mess that his government down at Westminster continually leave behind. It's this government that has a child poverty act. It's this government that are trying to ensure that people with disabilities in the country are treated with dignity. And it's this government that has provided a sporting uh, centre in Inverclyde which will now people with physical disabilities to be able to take part in, uh, in sport of their choice. Unlike his government, unlike uh, uh, Brian Whittle, I do not think that we will take any lessons from uh, Brian Whittle or the Conservative yeah, UK's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question number three, Gillian Martin. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what NHS workforce planning is undertaking in relation to the potential impact of Brexit on staffing levels. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Well, all of us in Scotland benefit enormously from the contribution made by NHS staff from across the European Union. The free movement of people from the EU and the EEA allows skilled and experienced health professionals to work here, providing safe, high-quality services to Scotland's people. The possible impact of Brexit on staffing levels within the NHS will depend on the precise form of withdrawal from the EU imposed by the UK Government. The Nursing and Midwifery Council reports that significantly fewer EEA nurses are registering in the UK 
And the BMA also reports that many EEA-trained doctors are considering leaving the UK. However, we may remain fully committed to, ensuring, uh, to continuing to recruit EEA healthcare staff, and we'll continue to work hard to protect their rights and place here in Scotland. Gillian Martin. Cabinet Secretary has already alluded to the nursing and midwifery council who have claimed that European staff are already leaving the UK in their droves. Latest statistics show 4,067 nurses in the EU left a job last year, a rise of around 67% from the previous year, and an 89% fall in the number of nurses coming to the, uh, to the UK to work uh, from EU countries. Brexit hasn't even happened yet, and the NHS is feeling its impact. Would the Cabinet Secretary outline any assessment she has done on the scale of the staffing crisis that could envelop the Scottish NHS and give detail on what contact she has had with the UK Brexit Minister and the Home Secretary to impress the urgency of clarity on their future immigration policy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the, f the figures cited by uh, Gillian Martin are very uh, concerning indeed, and that's why the Scottish Government has repeatedly called upon the UK Government to provide an immediate guarantee of the rights of all EU citizens living here. Uh, on the 1st of September, I wrote to the UK Government Home Secretary and the Health Secretary to signal my concerns about the approach being taken to Brexit, the uncertainty that the UK Government's position on Brexit is creating for EU <coughs> nationals and for their families and how it is uh, compromising our ability to recruit and retain talent. The Scottish Government believes that maintaining free movement of persons as part of the single market is in the best interest of the UK as a whole and of Scotland. Of course, uh, we are doing what we can to increase staffing here, and we have increased staffing by over 9%, and the, the numbers of qualified nurses and midwives have, have risen by 5.6% under this government, and we have plans to continue to increase the, the supply of, of health staff. But, uh, meanwhile, my Cabinet colleagues and I will continue to press the case for further clarity, because this will certainly uh, damage our potential uh, of recruiting uh, from uh, outward with Scotland in order to make sure that we maintain quality services here in Scotland. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think it's clear for all involved in this debate to realise that NHS Scotland's workforce problems did not begin on the 23rd of June 2016. They've been presided over by this government for 10 long years. And so what, what I want to ask the Cabinet Secretary is, given that Audit Scotland have said that the government's long-awaited workforce plan is not, in fact, a detailed plan after all, merely a broad framework, what plans do the, does the Cabinet Secretary and this government actually have to increase the number of nurses in our hospital wards? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, as Jeremy Hunt announced recently, they don't even have a workforce plan for NHS England. And I'm very happy to share our plans with Jeremy Hunt to get him on his way of actually delivering and developing a workforce plan. As Miles Briggs will know, we have already uh, published part one of the plan. Uh, the social care plan is, uh, is imminent and the primary care plan will follow once uh, we have a decision uh, on the GP contract going forward. We have already expanded uh, nursing uh, training places, 2,600 by the end of this parliament. We are expanding medical education with the graduate medical school and we have more training places for medics. So in addition, uh, we are taking the action here. But Miles Briggs likes to dismiss the issue of Brexit because it's uncomfortable for him to acknowledge that that will only add pressures, not just here in Scotland, but the rest of the UK on uh, our NHS and care services. Perhaps he would do well just to acknowledge that. Question number four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to raise awareness of the symptoms of pancreatic cancer. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, through our Detect Cancer Early programme, we aim to uh, increase the proportion of cancers that are detected at the earliest stages. Central to this is our social marketing strategy, and next year the programme will focus on the overall benefits of early detection for all cancers and aim to encourage anyone with any concerns or changes to their body to visit their GP. We're also committed to supporting GPs to be more aware of the potential signs and symptoms of cancer and updated the Scottish referral guidelines for suspected cancer in 2014. More recently, this has been supported by the uh, developed and uh, launch of an app uh, in 2016. My officials are in discussion with Pancreatic Cancer UK to discuss how we can support awareness uh, messaging through our We See strategy and social media and digital channels. Claire Adamson. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Um, Pancreatic Cancer UK um, carried out a survey which showed that 35% of adults in the UK would not be worried if they had several of the, p the potential symptoms of pancreatic cancer. Um, and does r raising awareness through events such as Pancreatic Cancer Month, which we've just had, Light Up Purple, and raising awareness of, of this cancer, which hasn't seen significant changes in outcomes uh, as other cancers has, does she, she support those um, um, campaigns going forward? <coughs> Secretary. Uh, yes, I, I very much do support those campaigns and I think the Light It Up Purple campaign is a way of, of raising awareness uh, among the public and of course we know uh, that the earlier a cancer is diagnosed the easier it is to treat and we recognise <laughs> that the signs and symptoms of pancreatic cancer can sometimes be vague and non-specific. Through the uh, collaboration with the Scottish Primary Care Cancer Group and third sector colleagues such as Macmillan Cancer Support, we are uh, commissioning a refresh of the Scottish referral guidelines for suspected cancer to take place in 2018 to ensure that any new and emerging evidence is considered. Uh, and this will be supported by the development of education and training on early diagnosis for primary care colleagues. Uh, I hope that will make a difference uh, in, uh, in making sure that we can in, uh, get people uh, into treatment earlier than we do at the moment. Tom Mason. Starting off, with a, there are problems with detecting late, late detection of pancreatic cancer. It's vital that these detections are done as quickly as possible. However, according to the latest figures, one in eight of cancer patients, patients are waiting more than 62 days for urgent treatment. Although we've just heard from the Cabinet Secretary some measures to counteract this, they're rather woolly. Can you be more specific and get that waiting time down well below 62 days and what can we expect in four years time? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I don't think my answer was woolly. I was laying out uh, some of the work we're doing to make sure that people are treated earlier by early detection. Uh, the 62 day uh, treatment that uh, Tom Mason uh, outlines, uh, I've already said very clearly that we need to uh, make improvements there. That's why we're investing additional uh, in funding into diagnostics. Uh, so once people are diagnosed, uh, treatment for cancer takes uh, place on average within six days. So the issue is improving diagnostics. Uh, and that is why I am chairing personally the Cancer Improvement Group, which is looking at rolling out some of the best practice that we see, for example, in NHS Lanarkshire, where they are meeting uh, the 62-day target. What I would say, though, is that for some of the complex cancers, um, the staging and the treatment is not always straightforward. And that is why the 62-day target only applies uh, to some cancers because of that complexity in treatment. So very happy to write to Tom Mason if that would be helpful to him in understanding some of those more complex issues. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government how many orthopaedic patients are waiting longer than the guaranteed waiting time limit of 12 weeks to receive treatment. Cabinet Secretary. In the quarter ending the 30th of September, uh, 4,060 patients had waited longer than 12 weeks for orthopaedic surgery, with 5,071 patients being treated within the legal guarantee. And I recognise some patients are experiencing long waits, which is why I've made £150 million available to the NHS over the next three years. £50 million has already been allocated to boards in the current year, and this additional funding will build up capacity and make sure that all patients are seen and treated in a timely fashion including in the specialty of orthopaedics and I expect to see improvements between now and the end of March <laughs> next year. There are challenges in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and they've been funded with an additional £500,000 to improve orthopaedic waiting times between now and the end of March and they expect to deliver significant improvements in waiting times through hip and knee replacements in the Golden Jubilee National Hospital as well as additional internal orthopaedic, orthopaedic activity. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response and her recognition that the treatment time guarantee actually means very little for those who are waiting longer than 12 weeks. I have many constituents, as she knows, who've waited much longer than even a year mm. for treatment. And the Cabinet Secretary has indeed announced 50 million to improve waiting times in May. That is welcome, 11 million of which is for NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. 
But that was May. We are now seven months on, and people in my area are still waiting far too long. Can she guarantee that we will see an improvement so that my constituents no longer need to wait beyond 12 weeks in pain for treatment? Cameron Sanders. <coughs> Uh, well, can I say to, to Jackie Bailey uh, that uh, indeed uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde have received 11.2 million of that 50 million. As she will appreciate, uh, it takes time to build up that capacity. But what I can tell her is that the board's feedback, not just Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but other health boards, are telling me that they are uh, seeing some of those uh, longest waits now reducing. Uh, I am uh, confident that between now and March we will see further improvement uh, on that and we have asked boards to tackle the longest waits uh, and uh, I am certainly uh, very very clear with boards that they have to do so and I've laid out in my answer to Jackie Bailey specifically the fact that we've given additional uh, funding of £500,000 uh, to help Glasgow make the further improvements they need to make between now and the end of March uh, very specifically uh, because of uh, the, the types of cases that Jackie Bailey has raised. Jackie Bailey. Sorry, uh, Lee McArthur. <laughs> <laughs> Lee MacArthur. <laughs> I'll try and step in for Jackie Bailey. I'm very grateful to Jackie Bailey, um, whose, the experience of whose constituents very much mirrors uh, those of my own in Orkney. The Cabinet Secretary be aware that capacity problems in NHS Grampian have led to similar delays. But is she aware that NHS Grampian appear to be sending outpatient letters now offering uh, appointments which have to be confirmed within a two-week period via a, a, a helpline that itself is very, very busy, only uh, available nine to five, Monday to, to Friday. And does she think that approach, passing the onus back on to patients uh, in confirming uh, appointments, is the best way of reducing uh, the waiting times, which are, as by her own acknowledgement, far, far too long? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Lee MacArthur that what NHS Grampian is doing is to try and manage their capacity as best they can and to ensure that every uh, patient, uh, op every appointment uh, opportunity is, is utilised. Um, what they are also doing, and Malcolm Wright, the Chief Executive of NHS Grampian, is doing is working across uh, the whole of the North area uh, with NHS Highland in particular to look at how they manage the capacity across the whole of the North of Scotland, particularly when it comes to elective and outpatient appointments. And I think that is a, a very uh, good move because we need to look at new ways of working. And uh, in addition to that, of course, the work that uh, Derek Bell is taking forward in reforming the way we deliver elective uh, procedures and outpatient appointments will make sure that we have a use of, uh, our capacity in the most effective and efficient way. Call Mark Griffin. Thank you, President. No, sir, my constituent, constituent who has been waiting a number of months for a specialist appointment was, was, appointment was in touch with me yesterday after having received once again a call from the ambulance service cancelling a booking to take him to hospital for an appointment today. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that cutbacks in one area of the service are making waiting times worse and hindering the efficient working of the wider service? Mm -hmm. uh, and surely in these cases where a cancellation is made at such short notice, arrangements for a, a taxi service should be made? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I am concerned to, to hear that particularly it's, it's not good uh, for patients to have um, <coughs> Uh, their, uh, their appointments cancelled at short notice. I'm not clear from what Mark Griffin is saying whether that's an issue for the Scottish Ambulance Service. If it is, what I would be keen for him to do is to write to me with the circumstances and I would certainly want to look into that because it is very, very important that uh, we have a joined up service here and that where someone does have an appointment, that that <coughs> appointment is kept. And if it's an issue of transportation to that appointment, then we need to get that resolved. So if Mark Griffin wants to write to me with the detail of that, I'll certainly look into that case. Question number six, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support and provide resources for organisations that promote healthy lifestyles. Minister Eileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, the Scottish Government has taken forward a wide range of actions, including funding in many key policy areas to encourage physical activity, improve diet, mental wellbeing, as well as initiatives to tackle alcohol and substance abuse. We aim to ensure that people in all of our communities, particularly children and their families, have the knowledge and skills to make healthy living choices. Alex Cole Hamilton. 
I thank the Minister for that answer. As we have heard, the Scottish Sports Association plays a vital part in connecting the value of sport in our communities with our efforts to improve the health of our nation through policy in this place. Does the Minister not consider that the withdrawal of funding from the SSA could be perceived as a cynical attempt to silence what is, in essence, the voice of sports in our communities before further budget cuts to sport are announced? And will the Minister listen to the consensus that has been established across the opposition benches this afternoon and directly fund the association going forward. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, again, you know, I re reiterate what I said already in previous uh, questions. Uh, the SSA is a membership organisation made up of sport and governing bodies, <coughs> and we route funding to support our governing bodies through Sport Scotland, and we don't provide core funding to the SSA. But we have a strong relationship with the SSA, and that's why last year we provided uh, funding to the SSA to enable them to take forward some short-term focused work. Uh, we'll continue to listen to other opposition members and we'll continue to, to listen to any other representation going forward. Uh, but uh, again, I reiterate, that was not core funding. That is done through their membership organisations and we route our support to governing bodies through uh, Support Scotland. Question number six, seven, sorry, John Mason. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde regarding the planned upgrade of the Parkhead Hospital site. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Plans for the Glasgow East End Health and Social Care Centre are at a relatively early stage and are currently being developed by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership. The Scottish Government are supportive of this project in principle and we're keen to review these plans as they develop. John Mason. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Would you accept that residents in the east end of Glasgow are very resistant to travelling to Stob Hill in the north of Glasgow for health facilities? And would you agree that it might help health, health outcomes in the east end of Glasgow if we had more facilities in the east end of Glasgow? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the member will be aware <coughs> that I <coughs> met with um, local stakeholders back in September as part of my consideration of the major service change proposals for local rehabilitation services, including uh, Lightburn Hospital. I can assure John Mason that I'm fully aware of both the significant levels of deprivation in the local area and the understandable concerns about appropriate access to services, including the issues around public transport. I intend to make my decision in respect of the major change proposals in the, the coming weeks. As I said, I welcome the commitment from the board and its planning partners to develop as a priority a health and social care hub in the east end of Glasgow for the benefit of local people. Question 8, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to reduce levels of drug use. Minister Eileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, we continue to take forward a range of initiatives to tackle problem drug use. We invest significant resources in education and prevention work and will shortly be issuing good practice guidance to the sector based on recent work looking at the effectiveness <coughs> of education and prevention initiatives. <coughs> We also work closely with Police Scotland and the UK Government to limit the supply of illicit drugs in Scotland and to support the effective implementation of the relevant legislation. Yesterday in the Chamber, I outlined my plans to introduce a drug and alcohol treatment strategy. This will seek to address the challenges that we face in our attempts to tackle problem drug and alcohol use, <coughs> whilst ensuring that we continue to provide high quality person-centred services that meet the wide ranging needs of those that are most at risk from these substances. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Minister for that answer, but I think what we need here is a bit of urgency. Worryingly, Dumfries and Galloway has the highest percentage of drug-related hospital admissions in Scotland. The number of people dying from drug overdoses in the area has reached a record high. Families are suffering and people are dying. What measures are the Scottish Government going to take in the here and now to tackle drug misuse in rural areas? Minister. Again, you know, I, I reiterated yesterday that because of the rise in drug-related deaths, that there is a real need for us to work out what we do better to enable those people to feel supported. That's why yesterday I set out that we're developing our seek, keep and treat approach, which is to understand the vulnerable cohort of ageing drug users that present in the uh, tra tragic uh, drug deaths that we see 
each year. <coughs> Again, though, the member is right to recognise that there are particular issues in rural uh, Scotland. And again, I'm happy to meet with him if he would like to take that opportunity as we seek to develop uh, that refreshed approach to make sure that we have a focus in on the rural uh, issues that he as a constituency member of uh, Dumfries, uh, in Dumfrieshire uh, wants to outline. Again, I'm, an, I'm a rural <coughs> MSP as well. I understand that sometimes services aren't always on your doorstep. That's why also it's important that we have this flourishing recovery community uh, across the country, some of them in rural parts of our country, to allow them to feel that they are supported and help them on their recovery journey. But again, that, that is an open opportunity for uh, David, uh, not David, sorry, <laughs> Oliver <audience>. Mandela <laughs> to take up because it's a really important <laughs> issue and there's an opportunity for us to work together in making sure that this has the cross-party support that we had last time when we yeah. presented Road to Recovery. Question number nine, Jamie Green. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to recruit and retain GPs in not NHS Ayrshire and Iron. Cameron Secretary. We know that uh, GP recruitment and retention is an issue uh, for some areas of Scotland. That's why the groundbreaking new GP contract for Scotland, jointly designed and agreed with the British Medical Association, will help ensure that GPs are able to spend more time with patients and less time on bureaucracy. If accepted, it will help reduce doctors' overall workload and make general practice an even more attractive career prospect by allowing GPs to focus on the patients who need them most. Not only that, but we've committed to increasing funding directly into general practice by 250 million by 2021, including over 71 million this year as part of a commitment to increase primary care funding by 500 million. We've also increased funding for GP recruitment and retention fivefold to five million pounds. And in Ayrshire and Arm, we've invested 400,000 of that GP recruitment fund to develop new posts with a special focus on particular subjects. They've successfully recruited four GPs who start in post this year. Jamie Green. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. All very warm words, but the reality is that the Scottish Government's GP recruitment and retention programme has only managed to attract three GPs to work in Ayrshire and Iron. We know that FOI figures show that the Health Board is paying up to £800 per day for locum GPs to cover those shifts. Does the Cabinet Secretary really think that's an effective use of our health budget? And what does she have to say to my constituents in Ayrshire who have lost their GP? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I would say to Jamie Green, as I have said to other members in this chamber, that the Recruitment and Retention Fund has funded a number of projects that are supporting not just the direct recruitment of GPs, but support structures around them. Uh, and instead of complaining about that, I would have thought Jamie Green might have welcomed that additional uh, investment. We're working very hard with the BMA to bring in a new era for primary care and a better deal for GPs. I hope that Jamie Green and his Tory colleagues will get behind that new contract because it is um, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity really to set general practice for the future of Scotland uh, and that will make it a very attractive career for young doctors making the, their decisions about which specialty to go in but maybe we need to talk up general practice a little bit more than we do. Kenneth Gibson. In the officer. Cabinet Secretary, the Tories have been frightening the old and sick in West Kilbride, my constituency, by saying for weeks the surgery will close. And in fact, a new GP is due to join the practice on the 1st of January and a post funded for two years by the GP Recruitment and Retention Fund. Furthermore, NHS Ayrshire, now, which currently runs the practice, is inviting tender bids by GP partnerships to take over. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that since taking over West Kilbride Medical Practice in August, NHS Ayrshire and Arne has made significant progress which they should be commended for and that there is no intention whatsoever to close the practice and can she also reassure patients and practice staff alike the end rumours to the contrary are untrue. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, uh, Kenny, Kenny Gibson is correct. The West Kilbride practice will not be closing its doors to patients and we should be highlighting the positive work underway to support that practice since the board took over in August 2017. And I think Kenny Gibson makes a good point. We should be talking up our GP services and making uh, an attractive uh, place to want to, to come and work, whether that's in Ayrshire and Arran or anywhere else in Scotland. I think Ayrshire and Arran have worked very, very hard to make sure that the West Kilbride practice uh, has a, a good and stable future. And I'm very uh, uh, happy to write to Kenny Gibson with any further details that uh, he might find helpful. Colin Smith. 
Thank you, President Officer. Just as there's growing demand for GP services in North Ayrshire and Arran, there's also growing demand for other services, not least chemotherapy. That service has been under review since 2014, and in 2015, NHS Ayrshire and Arran completed an options appraisal, which if implemented will lead to the loss of chemotherapy care at Air Hospital, forcing local cancer patients to travel up to 100 miles for treatment in Ayrshire. Given that it's now three years since that options appraisal was carried out, and in the meantime, demand continues to rise, and given that NHS Ayrshire and Arran have not yet even consulted on their proposal, will the Health Secretary intervene and urge the Health Board to drop this damaging and clearly unpopular proposal? So it's a little broad on the original question, but briefly, mm. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have spoken recently to uh, John Burns, um, the Chief Executive of Ayrshire and Arran, uh, about uh, this uh, matter in order to, to get an update. Uh, it is, of course, for Ayrshire and Arran, as it would be for any local board, to take forward their uh, local uh, services. But uh, what John Burns is uh, keen to do is to see uh, the chemotherapy service as part of the development of the West of Scotland Cancer Services. So uh, he is well aware of the strength of feeling. Uh, and what's important, as I've made very clear to him in my call to him, that he uh, consults properly with local people, taking into account their views and considerations uh, as they move forward with uh, proposals, whether that's for this service in Air Hospital or or any other across Ayrshire and Arran. Question number 10, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what impact engaging in sport and leisure activities has on mental health. Minister Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our vision is of a Scotland where more people are more active more often, in part because being active is good for mental well-being. The Active Living Becomes Achievable programme a collaboration between the Scottish Government and mental health charity Sam H builds on the well-established links between physical activity and improved mental well-being as well as physical health. This is further evidenced by the recent partnership announcement between Sam H and Jog Scotland, <coughs> which recognises the clear link between physical and mental health. Gordon Linters. For that answer, she will be aware of physical activity programmes such as the Healthy Active Minds project run by Edinburgh Leisure to assist those facing stress, anxiety, and depression. Does she welcome the fact that rates relief for leisure trusts will now be continued to allow for the provision of services like these, thanks to Scottish Conservative pressure? And will she? <laughs> and, and, and will she lobby colleagues to ensure that adequate funding is given to local authorities to allow for their long-term sustainability? Minister. Oh, well, I have, to laugh. <laughs> I have to laugh at the fact that they think that the Tories uh, managed to get the rates relief on uh, sport and leisure facilities, as if we hadn't been uh, working with our colleagues to take forward and look specifically at what was in the Barclay Review, which, of course, we're going to be debating later on. Right. Question number 11, Murdo Fraser. Right. Secretary Shona Robson. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all boards, including NHS Tayside, to discuss matters of importance to the local people. Murder Fraser. <laughs> uh, thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, her response. NHS Tayside have a plan to remove all emergency surgery from Perth Royal Infirmary and move it to Nine Wells in Dundee. This is a plan that has caused serious concern amongst many residents in Perth and Kinross in relation to the impact this decision might have on the future viability of the accident and emergency unit that exists at PRI. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give my constituents today? that under this government, the A&D unit in Perth has a secure future and will not be downgraded or closed. Cabinet Secretary. NHS Tayside has given a clear commitment that urgent unscheduled care will continue to be provided from the PRI, as has, have I, because the PRI is a very important uh, district general hospital, a very important part of the infrastructure of the NHS. Uh, and therefore, uh, I would hope uh, to uh, get rid of any scaremongering that might have been taking place around that issue. Um, of course, uh, the member is aware that uh, NHS Tayside has been carrying out a, a consultation about the delivery of surgery across Tayside. 
the board have been clear that no decisions have been made and any proposals agreed uh, by the board of, uh, of, of, uh, that are major change will come to me for a, a final decision. And I would uh, carefully consider all available information and representations made before reaching uh, my uh, decision. Uh, what's important, of course, is delivering safe patient care. That is the utmost uh, important thing here. And uh, in terms of uh, the, emer the, the, the emergency general surgery, I understand that the board took this temporary measure to ensure it could continue to provide a safe and appropriate level of care to its patients. I'm sure that's something Murdo Fraser would understand. Question 12, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government what the difference has been since 2007 between NHS Grampian's actual funding and the amount it should have been allocated under the NRAC formula. Cabinet Secretary. When the NRAC formula was introduced in 2009 10, NHS Grampian was 3.7% behind its target funding allocation. The Scottish Government has invested significantly in supporting those boards behind parity. In 2017 18, the Scottish Government invested an additional <coughs> £50 million of NRAC funding, which takes all boards for the first time within 1% of their target allocation. Since 2015 16, NHS Grampian has received an additional funding of £47 million pounds for the specific purpose of accelerating NRAC parity. My grumbles. Um, to answer the question I asked, it's £165 million. Pounds. That's the amount of money that the Scottish Government hasn't given NHS Grampian uh, since the NRAC formula. This is the information from the neutral Scottish Parliamentary Information Centre. And could I ask the Minister if she would ask her officials to contact SPICE just to make sure that I'm not misunderstanding her answer, that it is £165 million which Grampian should have received and has not, and it's already, even without the NRAC formula, the worst funded health board in the country. Cabinet Secretary. Well, if I recollect, the Labour Liberal Democrat administration did nothing about making sure that NHS Grampian's funding uh, was brought into line. The NRAC formula is there in order to make sure that issues such as deprivation are reflected in the funding that boards receive. Under this government since 2006-07, since uh, Mike Rumble's party was in administration, NHS Grampian's budget has increased by £315 million to almost £900 million in 2017-18, an increase of 54%. In addition to this, we're investing £128 million this year to support the delivery of service uh, reform, and NHS Grampian is, of course, benefiting uh, from this as well. The NRAC formula uh, reflects the most, is the most objective measure of of funding equity that we have developed. It takes explicit account of demographics, deprivation and geography in order to promote equity of access to health services for all residents across Scotland. Thank you. Can I thank the ministers and members? That concludes health questions. And we'll move on now to a statement on policing. We'll just take a few moments for the ministers to change seats and members.